One day, Anna looked out the living room window and saw her husband David standing over their infant's jogging stroller as he was about to go for a jog with their firstborn. And she saw on David's face doubt, enchantment, skepticism, and touched by his unusual display of emotions, with eyes glistening, she went outside, slipped her arm around David and said, a penny for your thoughts, honey? It's absolutely amazing, David responded in utter disbelief. I can't see how Target can sell this awesome jogging stroller for only 299 bucks. You've heard the expression, some people just can't see the forest for the trees. Often, when you concentrate on the details of something, you lose sight of the big picture. And that's one of the challenges with studying a passage, such as Ezekiel 1. We can spend so much time on all the rich and lavish details of the chapter that we miss the point to which it all leads. When you read Ezekiel 1, it's almost like a puzzle. Storm, lightning, fire, strange creatures, gyroscopes filled with eyes, a throne, a figure, fiery figure on top of the throne. Ezekiel is painting a picture with words and images that were familiar to the ancient Israelites. And all the particulars primarily serve to enrich the point of Ezekiel's vision. And that is that the Lord, in all his majesty and glory, is with his people in the most unexpected of circumstances and places. And because of this, the passage is a passage of hope. And if in seeking to understand exactly what Ezekiel saw, we fine tune the details and lose sight of this grand vision of the Lord that Ezekiel has, well, then we too are in danger of drowning in details and missing the forest, the message of hope, for the trees, the details, right? We don't want to drown in the details. So after the introductory superscription that we looked at last week, the account of Ezekiel's prophetic call continues with a detailed description of his theophanic vision, a vision of God, the longest recorded in scripture. Ezekiel's convoluted description of his inaugural vision is full of redundancy, giving the impression that he was so overwhelmed by this experience that he was repeatedly grasping for words in his attempts to describe what he witnessed. He begins his description in verse 4 by focusing on the windstorm coming out of the north. This is no ordinary cloud. Note how Ezekiel describes its sheer brilliance, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. Now, storms were often associated with theophanies in the Old Testament. The origin of this turbulent windstorm out of the north may prove significant for several reasons. Historically, Israel's enemies typically attacked from the north, Egypt being an obvious exception. Additionally, according to Canaanite mythology, the various gods of the pantheon, including Baal, dwelt in the north. And thus, this chariot throne emerging from the north might indicate the Lord's freedom to come and go as he pleases, even in enemy territory. In verses 5 to 14, we read that as the turbulent whirl whirlwind approaches, Ezekiel recognizes four quadrilateral living creatures, each with three pairs of wings and a set of intersecting wheels alongside them, and on top of which sat a brilliant expanse supporting a sapphire throne. The four living creatures have a human likeness and were comprised of four faces, one on each side. The face of a man, the face of a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Now, the selection of these animals may appear arbitrary to us, but composite creatures appear frequently on ancient glyptic art. 
According to Jewish tradition, these four were chosen because of the honor each held in their respective domains. They also had symbolic significance for the Israelites. The lion, a symbol of strength, ferocity, and courage, and a symbol of royalty. The eagle, with its swiftness, was a stately bird. The ox, the most valuable of domestic animals, was also a symbol of fertility and divinity. But despite their dignified status, here in Ezekiel's vision, the living creatures, including humankind, are equally the support class underneath the crystal-like firmament on which sits the Lord on his throne. These living creatures seen by Ezekiel are reminiscent of the cherubim associated with what? With the Ark of the Covenant, located where? In the Holy of Holies, which represented the footstool of the Lord's heavenly throne. Now, when Ezekiel sees these same living creatures in his second vision in chapters 8 through 11, which we'll look at next week, some, and this is, it occurs some 13 months later, he will positively, positively identify these four living creatures as the cherubim. But they're far from the rosy-cheeked, chubby, naked infants of popular mythology. Their role as throne bearer and guardians of God's holiness is what's emphasized. They're God's bodyguards, according to Genesis chapter 3. They guarded the Garden of Eden from Adam and Eve's intrusion, right? Preventing any intrusion of the profane into the realm of God's holiness. Now, Ezekiel observes a significant amount of movement in his vision as these living creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning according to verse 14. Everywhere Ezekiel looks, there's bustling activity. The Lord's throne is on wheels. It's a chariot that flies. And this chariot throne recalls that the Ark of the Covenant itself was called a chariot in Psalm 104 and 1 Chronicles 28. In verses 15 to 21, Ezekiel then identifies these intersecting wheels, perhaps like a gyroscope, associated with each of the four living creatures. And they have rims full of eyes all around, perhaps suggesting the omnipresence and omniscience of the Lord. The living creatures are so intimately connected to these intersecting wheels that they move simultaneously eager to respond to the Lord's commands and execute his will. Ezekiel twice observes that the inanimate wheels are animated by the spirit of the living creatures. In verses 22 to 27, the next thing Ezekiel is able to identify was what looked like an expanse or platform, sparkling like ice and awesome, spread above the living creatures. In addition to the stunning visual display, the auditory dimension of the theophany also catches Ezekiel's attention for the first time. He compares the noise produced by the movement of the living creatures' wings to the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army, in verse 24. The roar of rushing waters, the voice of the Almighty, the tumult of an army. All three similes point to the arresting volume of the noise. That noise, however, is overshadowed by an even more imposing sound. In verse 25, a voice from above the expanse over their heads. Ezekiel looks upwards in his attempt to locate the source of the voice where he sees above that palladium-like expanse what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, 
and there was brightness around him. In reverential vagueness, description gives way to approximation as Ezekiel grasps for words to explain what he sees. Did you notice the dominance of analogous language, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of, the likeness of, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. Ezekiel uses the word glory 19 times in his book, the first occurrence here in verse 28. The Hebrew word translated glory, kavod, comes from a Hebrew root, kavod, which means to be heavy or weighty. So, for example, in 1 Samuel 4.18, Eli is described as being overweight. He's heavy. He's kavod. It's used more often figuratively in the Old Testament, frequently to describe someone who possesses influence and honor. The particular expression, glory of the Lord, is a reference to the sheer weight of his majesty. The glory of the Lord is the physical manifestation of the presence of the Lord in all his splendor, radiance, holiness, purity, and magnificence. This visible manifestation of the Lord is evident in his filling of the tabernacle back in Exodus 40, after the tabernacle had been built and dedicated. And then also, it's in Solomon's temple, after the temple had been built and dedicated in 1 Kings 8, as the Lord comes to dwell with his people. Here in his inaugural vision, Ezekiel sees the Lord in all his glorious splendor in a place he never anticipated, pagan Babylon. Once Ezekiel realized he was observing the Lord in all his magnificent majesty on his chariot throne, he responds in the only appropriate way possible, prostrating himself to the ground. Why would the Lord leave his temple in Jerusalem and fly to Babylon? As Ezekiel will witness in his second vision, which we'll look at next week, it's because the Jerusalem temple had devolved into an object of misplaced trust, little more than a magical talisman, while idolatry ran rampant in the temple. The Lord had promised he would dwell with his people. While they themselves were wandering around the desert on their way to the land of promise, he dwelt in a tabernacle, a mobile home. Did you ever realize the Lord was willing to live in a mobile home to be with his people? during the wilderness wanderings? Once his people were settled in the land of promise, his dwelling moved to a fixed and stable edifice, the temple. You see, the temple was much more than simply a place where the Jews assembled to worship. It was the Lord's special dwelling place, his special house from which he chose to rule. The Lord's presence was so inextricably tied to the land of Judah, Jerusalem and the temple in particular, that to be driven out of the land is actually equated with being consigned to worship foreign gods by David himself in 1 Samuel 26, 19. Exile from the land of Judah was much more than living in a place other than home. It was a condition with spiritual and political implications that turned Israel's world upside down. God's dwelling presence among his people in the temple in Jerusalem provided them with a strong sense of security and comfort. But more than that, the temple of the Lord had become in the minds of the Israelites a guarantee of the Lord's absolute protection, regardless of their behavior and relationship to him. The idea that their idolatrous practices would drive the Lord from his temple had not entered their religious imagination. Instead of putting their trust in the Lord of the temple, they began trusting in the presence of the temple building itself. 
A natural question which this revolutionary vision would have evoked in the minds of those in exile was, if God has left Jerusalem and come to Babylon, what does that mean for Jerusalem? Ezekiel's note of foreboding is confirmed by the words of lament and mourning and woe, which are given to him on a scroll in chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. You see, after the deportation of 598 BC, most of the people focused their hope on the intact temple back in Jerusalem. As long as the temple stood, they had visible proof, so they thought, of the Lord's devotion and concern for them, which inspired confidence in a speedy return and a restoration of their country. Ezekiel saw the Lord where he least expected him. What did it mean for Ezekiel to see the Lord on his throne while in exile in Babylon? The Lord was not defeated despite Nebuchadnezzar's humbling of Judah. He was still on his throne. Through his heavenly chariot, his rule extended to the farthest corners of the earth. Here in Ezekiel's inaugural vision, the Lord displays the reality that he's not a static national deity, and thus his glory is not confined to the temple compound in Jerusalem, but was mobile so that he could be with his people in pagan Babylon. The vision that begins ominously with the storm approaching from the north also includes, in verse 28, the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. The Lord's coming in judgment is not the last word, and the rainbow, a sign of the covenant to Noah, serves as a reminder that judgment is not the final word. There's a ray of hope. God's covenant faithfulness, even in the midst of judgment. Through judgment, he establishes his kingdom. Now think about it. The people are in exile as a punishment for their sins of forsaking the Lord and persistently worshiping other gods. And yet God comes to be with them in exile. He had committed himself to the Israelites and had come to be with them. How? unlike the Lord, we are. And don't we have a tendency to project our own attitudes onto the Lord? What happens today? If, if you offend me, what do people do? They block people on Facebook. They ghost them, right? I don't want to be with you if you offend me. I don't want to talk with you. I don't want you in my life. But not the Lord. Israel is in exile precisely because they've offended the Lord, and yet he comes to be with them in exile. Life in exile was hard. They'd been ripped from all that was familiar at home, and yet the message of Ezekiel 1 is that despite their sins, God had not abandoned his people. They were not alone in the midst of their trials.